My job today, for 15 minutes, I was told to end the speech in an upbeat mode. But see, I come, I'm an immigrant. I come from a dur, dur place. Dur means really, really pessimistic. And a little town where we have always been very dur. So I want to start with a very dur prognosis before I actually go on to something which is more upbeat. And here is the dur prognosis. We've not gotten rid of the disaster of 2008. And this has a direct impact on ESG and sustainability and all the rest of it. The attempts by governments and central bankers to get out of that disaster has been this unprecedented amount of quantitative easing. The result of this unprecedented amount of quantitative easing, there are at least two economists here, and I think they'll chat if I get this wrong, is that we have driven the natural rate of interest down. By driving the natural rate of interest down, we have condemned the entire world to returns which cannot mathematically exceed on assets anywhere between at most 4%, more likely 1% to 2%. So in this environment, there is a real danger that people look at all the great work that you as a group do, we believe in, and say, that's all good. But the problem is, we need returns because 1% or 2% or 3% return on any investment is not good enough. And I think that's very wrong. And I think that kind of mentality is exactly what got us in trouble in the first place. And I say this not because I'm just from a dour place, but because actually my firm does surveys of asset owners, and we did one recently. And we got back the most heartbreaking to me answer ever. We got back an overwhelming number that said, and, and Tatiana, correct me if I get this wrong, that said, um, yes, ESG is really important. Second question, will you change your investment to incorporate ESG? No, returns are really, really important. It is still the separation between ESG and returns. And the reason that we have this separation, I think, is because we live in an Alice in Wonderland world. For those of you who haven't read the story, it's a story of a girl who goes down a whole rabbit hole and ends up in a fantasy world where everything is not as it seems and slightly upside down. And in this fantasy world in which we live in, the financial sector is somehow separate from the real world, as if they're completely apart. And that simply is not the case. So for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to try to convince you that the way forward is not as you've been discussing for the last two days. And I'm so sorry, Eric. He's going to get upset with me. Because you've all been trying to answer the question, how? How do we do this? How do we finance green bonds? Right? How, how do we get the regulator to change? How do we get the right investment? It's a how question. right? How question is an engineering question. It's a science question. But what we're faced with, ladies and gentlemen, is a philosophical question. It's about humanity. It's about our future and the planet. Why does it matter if the world gets 2% warmer? It matters because it affects humanity. It's not a how, it's a why. And why questions are philosophical questions. And the question that we take for granted, which is at the root of all of this, and is at the root of how we can fix this, is this, why does a finance system exist? Oh, it's to provide services. That's not an answer. That's a how. Why? why? Why do we exist, right? Because we want to make profits. Why? Because our investors expect profits. Why? Well, because they put their money down. Why? The reality is, and I said this in the earlier session, if you look at the size of the world markets, OECD numbers, 200 trillion capital markets, 150 generated by companies, 50 savings. The 50 savings control the 150. That's the size of it. The whole economy of the free world, essentially, is controlled by 50 savings. Who owns these 50 trillion of savings? They're not rich people. They're not philanthropists. They're ordinary working men and women. Why do they invest their money? Well, because they want to retire. What we've done is we've taken this idea of they want to retire, and we tried to change it into a heuristic. And the heuristic we changed it into is they want a cash sum at the end. And then we went to Munich Re, and then we went to ING, and then we went to all the companies that we invest in, and we said to them, OK, the heuristic is we want a higher return on equity. We want you to give us more cash. 
But we never asked, why do they want the money? They want the money because they want to retire. That means that they want to live in a pleasant surrounding. Well, sorry, if they're going to live in a pleasant surrounding, you can't have the world heating at two degrees. You just can't because pollution will get them because the price of water goes up. And by the way, the amount of money they're going to retire on in the developed world is tiny. It's tiny. The average saving pool in a DB fund, whether it's in the UK or whether it's in Australia, whether in the US, is about $500,000 when they finish. 300,000 pounds in the UK, that's 12,000 pounds a year retirement income. That's it. An increase in the price of water because of one and a half degree heating of 150 pounds a year is a lot of money. It wipes out 10% gain on the investment. So a massive gain in the markets means nothing if it bites up their return. Because the question is, they want to retire. Half of them are women, statistically. The why of investing is they want to make sure that their daughters and they themselves have an equal opportunity in the society they live in. We know that. They work for the companies that we talk about. So they care about the companies that treat their clients well. And by the way, they care about the companies that treat their employees well. Like me, like many like me in Europe or in America, they're immigrants. They care about what happens in the home country, even though they've become integrated. They care about development. They care about actually making a difference, impact. And if we accept this why, then I will posit to you that we change the reason we invest. And we change it so that all investment becomes impact. And if all the 50 trillion of investment becomes impact because we answer the question of why, then as investors speak to the CEOs of all the banks, including SOCGEN and all the others, they will say to them, what are you doing about impact? And then we will get what David wants. We'll get the owners pushing the companies to actually do the impact, and then this becomes less a discussion of how and more a discussion of where do we go from here. Now, 10 years ago, this would have sounded like the ravings of a lunatic. Five years ago, when I first became CEO, and David can vouch for this, people thought I was mildly eccentric and put it down for my love of country and Western music. Today, it is much more mainstream. And it's mainstream mainly because a few people, not me, because I wasn't here for the whole journey. I only arrived nine years ago. A few people, you, have worked tirelessly to change the way the world thinks. And that's why this is a philosophy question about why. Few, and there aren't many of you, look around the hall. It's half empty. Honestly, look, it's half empty. But a few people bound together working for a cause that is a good cause, that is a real cause, change history. A band of brothers and sisters that are few can change history. History was changed. We're standing here in Arabia. 1,400 years ago, two men set up at dawn out of Mecca to Medina, and they changed history. I live in England. Some 900 years ago, 1215, 50 French barons gathered together on a field. They changed history. In Parliament, in 1807, a fat, middle-aged Englishman called William Wilberforce stood up and gave a speech and changed history. A few can change history. And the history that you've got to change is not about the how. We'll figure that one out. That comes. It's the why. It's to go back to each institution and to say, we have a purpose. Finance has a purpose. And it is a good purpose. And it is to serve the beneficiaries. And it is to build the world. Because the truth is, no matter how much Eric tells us, the other Eric, that politicians shape the world, it is not true. The world is shaped by finance. What we do, how we invest our money, shapes how our children will live. It shapes whether we're going to have inequality in sub-Saharan Africa or not. It shapes whether we're going to have warming or not. And you have done an amazing job because you've come a long way. I'm not going to read you the list that I was given to read. It's got tons of stuff that's happened. But when COP21 was signed, I was flabbergasted. I was there, but I was flabbergasted. Because... Actually, people agreed that we have an agreement that the world does matter, that the environment does matter.
the amount of people who are now part of this program shows a massive change. The fact that we're discussing it and we're disagreeing and we're having slight tiffs between different institutions shows that there is change. The fact that people are committed to ESG shows there is change. And then if we take that down and we come down and we say, where is the why? I will say this. The how, as Munich Re has understood because it's been in this business the longest and because it suffered the most from San Francisco onwards, they have understood the concept of holistic returns. And holistic returns is the total outcome, the total impact of your investment. That is what it's about. So go after this meeting, back to the institutions you come from, not just thinking about the how, but think about actually changing the world, because you can. Because this is the time of change. You can feel it. The politicians, Mrs. May, a Tory prime minister, stands at the doors of Downing Street and talks about an inclusive society. Right? This has never happened with a Tory prime minister. Well, at least not in my lifetime. A Tory prime minister. We are beginning to see Mr. Obama talk about a more sustainable economy, an American president. This has not happened before. We can see the commitment in Paris. This has not happened before. So there is change that is happening at the top level, and it's happening on the people level. The, the, again, I'm going to use Munich as an example. The fact that young people who come and join you want to talk about ESG is echoed. I've said the same. Other firms have said exactly the same. It is echoed all through. The new generation understands that their future is at stake. And our job is to go back and galvanize them. And the galvanizing them comes down to one thing. We have a purpose. And our purpose is to ensure that we, as the human race, invest our capital in shaping a world that is worth giving to our children and grandchildren, because that is the purpose of investment. The how, yeah, will do the impact, will do the ESG, will make sure that we shrink the divergence between the rich and the poor, between the north and the south, will bring down temperatures, not just one and a half, it's not enough, you've got to bring it down more. We'll do all of that. The heart of it is this purpose. I thank you for accepting me as one of you, because you've made me one of the elite. So I've achieved one of my ambitions in life. And I look forward to coming and hearing how we're going forward as we go forward uh, in the coming years. So thank you very much. <laughs>